Hi everyone, have you ever wondered if generative AI, like ChatGPT and Midjourney, could be violating the spirit of copyright law? These models are trained on copyrighted images and text from throughout the internet. Should their outputs be considered some kind of fair use derived work? This isn't just semantics. Intellectual property law has massive implications on how artists and creators can make a living. Keep watching as we dive into the spirit and letter of copyright. This video has three sections. Why do we have copyright, digital copyright, and generative AI? Section one, why do we have copyright anyway? Specifically, it's intended to make sure that any royalties, any income from selling those books would go back to the original publisher and author. Copyright is the basis for a lot of intellectual property law, including patents and other protections. Copyright dates back to 1710, when the first copyright law was enacted in Britain. It granted publishers of a book legal protection for 14 years, meaning that an author could give a book to a publisher and that publisher would have the rights to publish the book for a 14 year period. After that point, the copyright would expire and other people could produce their own copies of books without worrying about prosecution. The US created a copyright law in 1790, which was a little bit broader scope. It protected books, maps, and charts also for a period of 14 years. Intellectual property law has undergone a lot of changes since then. And today, most copyright lasts for the lifetime of the author plus 50 years. Sometimes the lifetime of the author plus 70 years, as it is in the US, it just depends on your jurisdiction and country. Anecdotally, a big reason for this expansion of copyright is actually the Mickey Mouse franchise. Disney lobbied to continue having the expiration date of copyright pushed further and further ahead so that Mickey Mouse would not enter the public domain. Public domain is a term for when something is not copyrighted, it's for the whole public, in other words. Essentially, that would allow anyone to create Mickey Mouse merchandise, Mickey Mouse videos, and so on, and publish them, and there would be no way to prosecute them under law. That doesn't mean that other people can't copy the work. It just means that you have the right to sue them in that event. Or the first time that a work appeared in public is important to resolve copyright disputes because if someone else claims that they created it first, then you might be in trouble from copyright law perspective. And again, it's a legal right, but not an obligation to defend copying. So I could have a copyright on a story that I wrote and put it on the internet. And if I say, please feel free to copy this, and people actually do copy it, that's totally fine. Even though I still retain the copyright on that work, if I'm not enforcing the copyright, then there's no harm done. Of course, corporations are usually very interested in enforcing their copyright. It's also worth mentioning that this is the right, but not the obligation to defend copying. In other words, you're not gonna get pulled into a legal battle against your will if someone copies your stuff and you have the copyright over it, so you get dragged into it. Actually, when I produced my PhD thesis and gave it to the university, I had two options. I could either retain copyright over that thesis and then the obligation to sue people if I wanted to would be mine, or I could assign copyright to the university and they would initiate any necessary litigation on my behalf, which is pretty weird. I would definitely prefer to have the copyright so that if I want to move it to different mediums, for example, create an audio version, anything like that, that it would be within my rights to do so. And anyway, if anyone copies a PhD thesis, they'll be exposed pretty quickly if people start asking them questions about it. One other thing to mention about copyright is that it, but copyrights are automatically assigned as per the Berne Convention from 1886. So they've been that way for a long time. You don't even necessarily have to write copyright me 2023 on some work that you produce. The fact that you've produced it is enough for you to hold the copyright. Second section, let's talk about digital copyright. Copyright was originally designed for physical objects like books. And when you take it into the digital domain, there are some weird quirks that emerge. In particular, copyright is trying to enforce scarcity. But digital objects don't have scarcity by nature. Copying is simple, unless you take strong measures to prevent it. Copyright in software used to not be allowed until a company successfully argued that it made a different type of machine, and if you had a different machine, then you could copyright it or patent it. So all of these intellectual property rights started getting layered on top of software. That's when the open source movement created open source software licenses. And the intent of an open source license is usually to tear down most of the restrictions and obligations and so on put into place by copyright law. Open source usually just means, please copy this source code and use it for your own purposes. Sometimes it also says, if you modify that source code to make it better, please give me the changes as well so that I can benefit. And it's written as a license agreement that leverages copyright law to effectively do the opposite of what copyright law was originally intended to do. That's why the most famous open source license called the GPL is actually called Copyleft. Moving away from software and thinking about digital media, like movies or audio or even text that's reproduced online, there are equivalents of open source licenses. The most famous is the Creative Commons license, which basically says, please use this online for your own purposes. You do not need to give me money, but it also includes some protections against you yourself being sued, 
because in copyright law, I guess people are always suing each other. When it comes to enforcing scarcity on digital media, there's actually a problem. The technology that enforces this scarcity is usually called DRM or digital rights management. And DRM is a fundamentally contradictory technology. It's basically trying to keep something secret until you actually want to look at it and then it makes it available to you. In other words, you can't copy the movie from my computer to your computer, but if you want to watch the movie, then it's just there for you. Then it's just given to you in plain pixels and you can actually watch it. Technically speaking, DRM is implemented using cryptography. So the content is encrypted before it's sent to you so that it can't be copied by someone else. You have to have the decryption key for that encryption in order to actually view the content. It's a little bit different for software because software can be compiled down to code. Software can run on servers, that sort of thing but digital media is fundamentally meant to be seen by you. And yet DRM tries to hide it until the very last moment when you actually want to see it. So what this actually means is that any device that actually plays digital media, think DVD players or movie playing software on your computer or even ebook readers, they generally have decryption keys built into the hardware. And those decryption keys allow them to access the content of any book or movie or file that's given to them. There was a very famous example in 2007 of a 128-bit encryption key that was the cryptographic key used to encode HD DVDs and Blu-ray discs. And this 128-bit number, every DRM movie being immediately accessible, so someone reverse engineered it. I don't know how, I guess they probably took apart the hardware and read that number straight out of it. But once they figured out that number, they just published it online. Media companies tried to get it shut down. They tried to ask Google to shut down all copies of this number. But then steganography kicked in and people started writing down this number in very hard to detect ways. They would encode it in images, they would print it on t-shirts, they would do all kinds of things. It's very hard to suppress information once it's out there. It's called the 09F9 number if you're curious. Then the US created the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which made it illegal to circumvent DRM technology. Again, they were just having to prop up this technology, which was fundamentally contradictory by saying, it's illegal, you'll have jail time or large fines if you try to mess with it. Cryptography is full of these really weird results like this, which usually result in the US outlawing something and then the same thing getting recreated outside the US. For example, the US outlawed the export of cryptography, originally classifying it as a munition. So a lot of cryptographers in Australia just recreated a lot of the same algorithms. Anyway, that's why you can find DDRM online and that sort of thing. Even though it is illegal in the US, it might be legal in your country. Third section. How does all this relate to generative AI? Well, generative AI, like ChatGPT for text, or Midjourney, or Stable Diffusion, or DALI for images, all generative AI is trained on tons and tons of examples. In ChatGPT's case, hundreds of gigabytes worth of text. In the case of image generation systems, tons and tons of copyrighted images from the internet. In theory, these models could reproduce the training input if you gave it exactly the right request. In other words, it could violate copyright if you knew the exact right prompt to give it. The thing is, this is exactly the same process that humans go through. A human will consume tons and tons of media from online, think it over, steal like an artist, and then go create their own work, which is partially derivative and partially original. The only way that these machine learning algorithms are different is that they've potentially seen almost every image in existence or almost every text online. But it's a matter of degree, not quality. Even when it comes to humans creating stuff, the only way to actually enforce copyright is to make a giant list of all the things that are actually copyrighted. That's how DMCA takedowns work on YouTube and Twitch and so on. In case you're curious, GPT-3 was trained on about 570 gigabytes of text. Some of that text was sampled two or three times during the training process though. And GPT-3 itself was trained on 400 billion tokens, 400 billion words essentially. And it has 175 billion parameters in which to encode that information. It can't actually completely memorize every single piece of training data, but it's on the same order of magnitude. GPT-3 was one of the first large language models to support few shot learning. In fact, the original uh, GPT-3 paper has that in its title. And this means that it's able to learn from just a few examples what to do in certain situations. Humans are even better at that, but this was far better than any previous model. So as you get more and more parameters or more and more neurons in the case of biological brains, you start developing a lot of abstractions that can predict a lot of content. And when you can predict the content, you actually don't have to store all of the different details of it. GPT-4, of course, has about a trillion parameters, we think, and it's been given even more stuff that it may have memorized. Of course, it was evaluated on novel problems that were definitely not in its training database. But nevertheless, one trillion parameters is a lot of space in which to store information. And indeed, someone ran some tests to see how many books GPT-3 and GPT-4 may have read. Of course, you can't figure that out externally from outside OpenAI, but there's a clever idea where you take a passage from the book 
that only contains one proper name, you remove that name, and you ask the model to predict the name. If it can do it correctly, then it probably knows that, that passage from that book. Again, to some degree of accuracy. It might just have a very fuzzy understanding of it. It might be able to remember it very, very clearly if it's something that's mentioned frequently in its training data. For example, a lot of Harry Potter passages are probably pretty easy for GPT to remember. There's actually a strong bias of the GPT models to being able to recognize science fiction and to a lesser extent fantasy. Perhaps because it appears a lot online or perhaps the biases of the computer scientists that trained it somehow ended up in there. Anyway, there's an interesting list of different books and to what percentage GPT-3 and GPT-4 can recognize those books. I'll leave the link in the description below. Finally, if you want to do more reading on this subject, I suggest you check out the New Yorker article titled ChatGPT is a blurry JPEG of the web. I'll also leave a link to that in the description below. It's a pretty good description because JPEGs, you know, lose information. They're a lossy compression mechanism for images. And that's effectively what a large language model is. It's a lossy compression mechanism for information, for text information. And of course, that's why models hallucinate because they try to reconstruct output from this lossy storage of information. So it can't necessarily tell when something is true or not. So the question is, does ChatGPT violate the letter or the spirit of copyright law? Again, I think you would have to treat it the same way you do a human. We're consuming and using for training input, producing an output which is substantially different from any copyrighted work is probably fine. And you could evaluate this again by using like a list of all copyrighted works out there, for example. But if the model produces or is convinced to produce something which is substantially similar to an existing copyrighted work, that's obviously a violation of copyright law. One small addition that would probably have to be made to law is that Copyright currently applies only to human-generated works. Right now, it just does not apply to anything that's generated automatically by a tool. So there's a bit of catch-up to do, but that's pretty common when it comes to law and technology. All right, finally, in conclusion, copyright has been around for a long time and was originally designed to protect physical works like books. It was adapted to work for digital works like software and movies and audiobooks and so on. But there was a little rough around the edges in terms of that adaptation because digital works are by nature easy to copy and you have to put a lot of work in to make sure that they cannot be copied, especially if the final plain text version is supposed to actually be read by someone at the end of the day. Generative AI might look new, but it's really nothing different. It's just a human that's sped up and is able to see more stuff than any human can. And we already have automated enforcement of copyright law to some degree when it comes to things like DMCA violations on different websites. So the same thing can happen in the age of generative AI. It should be the case that reading input, even if it's copyrighted, is no problem. Generating an output which is substantially similar to some copyrighted work, whether that was in the input or not, is obviously a violation of copyright law, whether it's a human doing it and stealing like an artist or ChatGPT. All right, if you have any questions or comments about copyrights or other intellectual property law, please leave them in the comments below. I'd be happy to talk about it as much as I can, although I am not a lawyer. If you enjoyed this video, please check out this previous one I made about why no one saw ChatGPT coming. All right, that's all I have for today. Thank you very much for watching. Bye.